uh, I think we are live and we have Dr. Cameron Murray here uh, to talk to us about a lot of things, um, housing economics, corruption, uh, rent control, um, and also potentially we might get onto some broader questions about, about economics uh, and economic theory and economics education if we have the time, but we'll see how it goes. Hello, right, okay, I've got my first person in chat, so that means that uh, everything has worked. Uh, all right, so um, so Cameron, I mean, I we've we've kind of followed each other right on Twitter or um, economics or the economics blogosphere uh, for like I don't know over a decade, right? Um, and yep. <laughs> uh, but we never actually had a conversation in in person. Uh, so I'm really excited to actually talk to you and kind of uh, pick your brains because I know we've got um, a lot of, I guess you could call them heretical views about economics and uh, and uh, about housing economics. Uh, so first, if you could just like yep. introduce yourself to us and uh, give us a bit on your background, that'd be great. Yeah, great. So Cameron Murray is my name. Yeah. And uh, so currently I'm a research fellow in the Henry Halloran Trust, which is an independently funded research group at the University of Sydney. And my main research topic is housing economics and the interaction of planning and, and housing markets. Um, the reason I, I sort of landed in this position is in the early 2000s, I got my first degree in property economics. I wanted to be a property developer and make the easy money during the 2000s boom. Um, I did end up working for a couple of developers, but I, I ended up doing a master's degree, getting a little bit more into the environmental sort of questions, uh, doing a master's degree in environmental economics, and ultimately um, spent a few years uh, in various government departments after that, and uh, seeing from the inside how how the public service operated and the political machinery. I. I then decided I'd do a PhD on uh, political favoritism and corruption, which I did at UQ uh, with Professor Paul Friders, who I think is now at the London School of Economics. And uh, so I did that for a while, um, did some consulting work. And yeah, this, this job came up and it just it fitted me perfectly. And so I've had uh, the opportunity to just dig in and, and do some new and interesting research uh, about housing markets. So that's what I've been doing lately. Excellent. So, um, so you you talked a little bit uh, about being inside the government machine and and being motivated to uh, write a PhD thesis on uh, political favoritism, which eventually became a book, right? That's right. So the thing about academia, and I think this is you know how we met is, or well, on virtually, is that um, a lot of knowledge is just hidden away in the journals and in the minds of academics. Um, and the really great thing about the 20 teens and after the financial crisis was, you know, academics talking to each other just directly through blogs and having commentary. And so I was involved in that. And so myself and Paul Fried as my PhD supervisor, we, we both saw the value in just getting all this research we'd done on political favoritism. You know, we'd, crunch numbers on data, we'd map social networks of politically favoured people, uh, we, did, we did computer experiments getting groups to form and steal money off each other. Uh, we thought, well, there's no point hiding this um, in, ac in the academic journals, we, we need to translate it for the broader sort of public good. Um, so that's Game of Mates that came out in 2017. There's actually going to be an updated version of that coming out later this year. Right. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I've I read I read Game of Mates. I think when it first came out, um, and there was some pretty hefty figures for how much corruption, or as you call it, Bruce, right? Uh, which is 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 Bruce like? Is that an Aussie like kind of pejorative term or? No, it's just the most Aussie name I could think of. My <laughs> uncle's name's Bruce, okay. and he's the most Aussie guy I know. And I'm just like, you know, this is the guy who's, you know, in a sing and thongs in summer in Australia. He gets up, he goes to work every day. He doesn't want to follow politics. It's just, you know, family, friends, having a good time, working hard. Um, so, 
Uh, yeah, so the book's written, basically, there's a there's a character called James, who's part of this well-connected uh, elite network, and then there's Bruce, who's totally um, detached from politics. And, and every time, you know, in every industry, James has rigged the rules in his favour, and so things that, that should be shared socially, you know, that could go to Bruce, like, you know, taxing um, oil, the Norwegian style, compared to the Australian style, well, our character Bruce misses out. It's just it was just a, a way to sort of tell what's really quite a bland um, technical sort of story with some very abstract ideas to just get you thinking of a character when you come across and go, oh yeah, that politician in my area is a bit like that, or that that property developer in my area has always seems to you know have his finger in all these political pies. Yeah, so that's <laughs> that's that's how the book is, Game of Mates. Yeah. Yeah. So Bruce, so Bruce is like the kind of everyday character, and James is James like what is that like the posh the posh name that you could think of or? <laughs> yeah, basically posh, the, just some kind of posh name. Um, but what's most interesting is that uh, you know we just had a stand in James. I'm like, let's just start writing and and trying to see if it would work, and then the ver the one of the first chapters is about property development in Australia. And of course, you know, when you enclose a bit of land, you have to come up with a system for divvying up who has the property rights to that land. And it turns out that the very first private individual in Australia to own private land, his name uh, was James. Uh, so that was convenient. What's his, sur his surname will come to me in a second. So I thought, well, that's a good way to explain why our character is James. James got a lot of favours, a lot of land given to him from uh, the governor um, when the land title system was first created in New South Wales. Right. So, I mean, that kind of links to, to something that I wanted to talk about with you, right? Because when you're talking about divvying up property rights, uh, I, I think, you know, it's clear from your work and, and not just Game of Mates, but like what I've read from you uh, over the years, one of your main points is that there's there's not really a neutral way to do that, right? It often favours certain groups um, and it's always a legal process. So maybe, could you talk us through maybe a bit more through that example you just mentioned and how it's actually done in a way that favours elites in Australia? Yeah, oh, look, there's... Property is a really tricky concept to talk about um, because everyone deals with property every day. So there's a lot of you know intellectual baggage. We all think we know what it is when we see it, right? <laughs> um, so uh, I guess yeah. The point the point is you know property is a system of carving up the three dimensional space and providing exclusive rights to certain people over exclusive sections of that space. Um, that's the sort of how I see uh, the property system. And so anytime you change who has rights to do what in any particular part of the space, whether you, you anytime you make a public investment that changes the value of one space instead of another, what you're doing is making a discretionary decision to sort of allocate economic value to someone instead of someone else. So let's think about building a train line um, to a certain area. Uh, that train line will be publicly funded from the collective, whatever the distribution of taxation is in, in the economy. But the beneficiaries will be very concentrated on the landowners who already own land in that corridor. And what you find in those sort of situations is a lot of gaming, for example. So when, when a railway line is at an early stage of design and discussion, well-connected insiders will go and they'll take options on land that are near um the the proposed train line or one of the investigation corridors or you know or the, what they'll do is they'll try and steer the process towards having a train station where they already own land and so what you're doing is you're saying well we, certain people own certain parts of the world and what we're doing by our public choices is is increasing the value of some people's sections more than others and that also relates to systems of planning and zoning so you can think about Property is a system of rights. So inside this three-dimensional space we've carved out for you, uh, we apply th the law, essentially, the set of rules that say what you can and can't do. And people have this idea that it's absolute. Property is mine, you know, from the, uh, the centre of the earth to the sky, which it's obviously not because you can 
dr drill a tunnel underneath someone's land and it's you're not trespassing. You can fly a plane over someone's property and it's not trespassing. You can, uh, you know, in, in Australia, you don't own the rights to any minerals under your soil on your land, for example. Mm. So the rights are all, all limited and, and planning is one of those things. And so, for example, if it's in this piece of property or space, the rules say, you know, you can build detached housing. And then you know, we decide for some reason we want to change how the city grows. We can uh, change that rule and say, now you can build high rise. And that has a value, that new right that is granted to that person in that piece of space. And you could sell that right to them. You could create a separate piece of property called, uh, this is a right to build high rise in an area currently designated for detached housing. And you could auction that and sell it. Hmm. But what happens in disguise in the planning system is we just give it to you for free. And it might be worth, you know, $25 million in just one sort of decision. And I looked in my um, PhD thesis at six major rezoning decisions just in Southeast Queensland uh, in Australia and uh, found that the value of property rights given through rezoning in those six areas was $710 million, of which when I looked at the political and social networks of landowners, so I, you know, I scraped all the corporate databases of cross directorships and biographies of politicians and the donors and the um, professional lobbyists, and I mapped this network of over 12,000 individuals and uh, companies and over a quarter of a million types of relationships between them. What you found is that uh, if you got that beneficial rezoning, you're, you know, you're much more likely to be well connected politically than someone next door or across the road with otherwise identical land geographically and, and in terms of location. So, you know, the, the conclusion there is that it's actually the political connections that determine that this new valuable property right was given through the zoning system to the property owners in this area rather than just next door. Um, so that and, and when I was working in property development, you know, that, that's the main game, right? Buying a, one set of property rights and waiting for the rules to change to get a more valuable set. That's where the big money is. It's not in actually constructing housing. That's very risky. <laughs> you just want to own the land when the rules change in your favor. And that's why those political connections are so important. Wow, yeah, that's really interesting. There's a, a, lot, of, a lot of things I want to uh, talk about in, in what you just said. So, I mean... Yeah, I, I mean, what strikes me is that it was it was a process for you of observing this, right, in, in reality, observing the actual corruption and then being like, right, somebody's got to study this, um, which is kind of like the opposite to what a lot of economists do, where they kind of, they're more like, well, this is how I think things might happen according to my theory or whatever, and then I'm going to go out and apply my theory. So yours was much more motivated by like actual experience in the real world as a, as a property developer. Yeah, I mean that that, and and to be honest, that's been my approach since then. Is um, you know, there's a lot of debate at the moment about housing supply being constrained, mm. and that that's why houses are expensive. Um, something we should definitely talk about. Mm. Yeah, but you know, I worked for these developers, and I remember um, well, this was an industrial developer. They bought a uh, a large plot of land. And that was ready to go to subdivide into large industrial lots. Yeah. And they said, well, we could do that. Or alternatively, we could apply for a business park type, you know, higher density, higher value type of uh, subdivision and project that is currently not within the rules. But I'm going to, you know, try my hand because the planning scheme has this legal flexibility. And I remember, I remember the, the big boss saying, yeah, well, there's no point me, you know, doing a low value industrial subdivision. It doesn't matter if it takes me 10 years to get the rules changed. It's, it's going to be worth it. So they were there able to do an industrial subdivision instantly hmm. and get approved, you know, at the end of the month and start the bulldozers. But they chose instead to wait potentially a decade or more to get a higher value return and that's one of the key issues in property that you need to understand and especially it comes up now in the you know in the u.s there's this big yimby movement oh we've got to unleash unleash the market to 
to decrease prices. Well, the market doesn't want to, f- you know, prices to go down. Property owners aren't foolish, just like because they own an asset and that asset goes up in value over time. They don't have to sell it to make money. It sits on their balance sheet. If they make more in the future, they're trading off, do I, do I develop now or do I develop next year when prices are higher? And that gradient, you know, on how much the return is to delaying is how is, determines how fast the market will supply. And that's that's actually, you know, something I've been studying a lot recently. I don't know. The term is land banking. Mm. I don't know if that's the same term in the UK, is it? For developers who hold large land banks, but then supply at a rate to make sure they're not depressing the price and maximizing that value over time. Is it it called land bank? I think we call it land banking here, yeah. Mm. Um, Yeah, so the Georgists will be very happy about everything you've just said, um, or excited, I should (laughs) say, right? Because it, I mean, it speaks to this like difference, the fundamental difference, right, between perhaps housing or, or land and other assets, because you can just hold on to it, right? Any other asset, even a durable one, like a car or a fridge um, is going to depreciate. So you can't, you don't have as much opportunity to land bank, right? You can't land bank with apples or cars or something because they're going to lose a lot of value. But land, if anything, like you were saying, right, gains value. So it doesn't matter if you loosen the planning restrictions because ultimately the restrictions are coming from the private investors who are saying, no, I don't want to do anything with this land. I can hold on to it and the present discounted value or whatever whatever formula they're using, um, that's going to be higher if I hold on to it for 10 years, leaving it, doing nothing yeah. with it. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. You don't want to undermine your future returns by building something now. And uh, and you're right. You know, I think it's it's something a lot of people struggle to comprehend that the the property, the land, well, we call it land, but it's really three-dimensional space, right? You don't own the soil necessarily. You don't own the minerals. You can dig all the soil out and stick it somewhere else. You still own that big empty hole, right? Um, so, you know, you've got to, um, to, to differentiate the location and the object that you put on that location. So, you know, it's probably best to think about um, the housing market as if all dwellings were caravans, Right on wheels uh, and we go well if that was the case we wouldn't say we have a housing shortage because you know you can build caravans wherever you like we have a uh, a pricing issue with the system of how we allocate places to put the caravans right that's what you know that's what what's a, what allows um you know property markets to rise with the sort of average incomes of society rather than get bid down over time like uh, produced consumer goods quite often do so yeah you've got to have that distinction in mind and and people confuse it for example you know a question that often comes up is well you know housing developers are in the business of selling houses that's how they make money i said no they're not no (laughs) (laughs) that developing a house is one way to transform your rights to that three-dimensional space into cash it's one way and it requires a lot of your own cash to build the physical structure to sell it to the market to get other cash back yeah but a better way to do it is to just wait (laughs) and convert it to cash sometime in the future when the potential development is much higher and the value is much higher because all you're doing right when you're developing um, property is you're swapping one asset undeveloped land for cash on your balance sheet and the question would be why would I be in a hurry to convert an awesome asset like undeveloped land that's going up probably 25 to 40 percent in value per year right now for cash which is getting two percent in which I'll have to go and outbid someone to put it back into land again right so you've got to think about it as an asset rather yeah. than a consumer good and you've got to separate that you know that right to the three-dimensional space that's the asset the is building it, it yeah. does depreciate it's a it's a completely different way of approaching it, I think, right? I mean I mean, well, it's certainly a different way of approaching it than kind of ignoring it, which I guess you could say is what conventional ec- economists have done, right? It's a you know, there's capital and there's labor and there's yeah. no land, there's not necessarily anything special about land. Um but if they were to approach it, um I, they wouldn't necessarily think of it as a financial asset in the way you have, right? No, no, that's right. Um, there's actually a, an author. I'm thinking about who it is. I think it's this book here. It happens to be right on my shelf. 
Economists in the Powerful. Oh, yes. Uh, Nor- I don't know if you've read that one. I have, yeah. And I think, part- I don't know if it's this book or it's uh, something by Michael Hudson, but uh, it-, it makes a case that the rise of sort of modern neoclassical economics was actually politically motivated by, um, you know, the elite networks to undermine the popularity of Henry George, who obviously put property at the front and centre um, in the 18, um, late 1800s, I think 1890s, there was a big uh, property market uh, crash, especially in Australia, that, that massively boosted his popularity. And obviously the landowners thought, well, I don't, you know, we've been making easy money for a century. We don't want a big political movement uh, rising up to distribute that property wealth. Um, what we'll do is we'll finance, uh, you know, like think tanks, ec- economists and universities, and we'll give land grants to universities to to create these departments that will explain how land is like anything else and, you know, private markets are the best way to allocate land. So, yeah. you know, that <laughs> some people have that sort of history. Uh, you're right. And the Georgists, yeah, I, I would say I'm a sort of modern interpretation of, of, of many of the core ideas of Henry George for sure but I think I'm taking it a little bit further with you know modeling these dynamics this intertemporal asset dynamics which everyone had observed for centuries you know the property market cycles the boom and bust the problem of um, you know progress and poverty lots and lots of wealthy landowners and lots and lots of peasants who can't afford to live anywhere mm. you know that's that's part of the dynamic but I, you know I think I'm working on now ways to integrate that and communicate it to you know your neoclassically trained economists, and and it's had a pretty reasonable reception because you know it it, it does fit you know it does fit the simple economic story of you know if you make more money in the future, don't don't close off that option by developing now. It is in a way, it is like kind of a basic economic idea, isn't it? What you're saying, right? Or it should be, but it is like uh, again kind of ignored by economists. Um, there's also the book, was it the Corruption of Economics by Mason Gaffney? I think that goes. Yeah, into I detail think that might be the George. one. Yeah, I don't. I'm, I can't remember. Uh, to be honest with you, I read Economist and the Powerful best part of a decade ago, so I, I can't remember. But they they might talk about it in there as well. They probably do. But I think the original uh, source was Mason Gaffney, right? Um, I've got I one question right. in chat yeah, for you. Yeah. Somebody said. Great. Uh, so, uh, just popped in. Gaston Ehrman says. Um, I've just popped in, but this is not true for cities, right? Because all the land has already been used to build stuff. So what what do you think of that? Uh, well, mostly that's not true. I mean, every piece of land, when you build a building on it, is used up, right? So you could, you know, for example, if you look at Australian cities, it, so, you know, let's just collapse the the uh the space so we've got the city center here and the um the fringes here and we've got this sort of radius right it's not the case that the city only expands on the end it's the case that actually the distribution of new dwellings looks like that it in fact grows like this because what happens after a certain amount of time um buildings that were the highest and best use the most valuable thing you could do with land in a what used to be the urban fringe are now very low value and totally ripe for redevelopment because you know you've got this very low cash flow and this high maintenance cost from the existing building. At some point in time, it makes sense to then flip that and get on a new curve through time of higher value development. I mean, look at New York City and Manhattan. It's, the construction just does not stop there, right? The 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 incremental and and um, that sort of step change redevelopment site by site. Um, occurs now obviously things like heritage protection will stop that in certain areas and in cities like Paris where that's quite extensive what they do is they they essentially build a new commercial center for the city and that's sort of planned at a, at a city and state sort of level but it's it's not um, the case and, and what I find quite interesting is that you know in Australia of all places housing developers keep saying there's a shortage of land we can't build anywhere. We need all this rezoning. But if you look at their balance sheets, they've got, you know, 70,000 approved and undeveloped lots and they're targeting three or 4,000 sales per year. Yeah. They own it. I, all they want is new rules that make it more valuable before they actually develop because that's where the big payoff is. 
Yeah, I think it's it's interesting because this, I mean, we were talking about the YIMBY debate, so maybe maybe it's a good time to talk about zoning, right? Because um, it's a huge issue uh, online. And I, I, I have like some YIMBY tendencies in that I kind of, um, number one, I think there is there is a specific context in the US where there's this whole history of um, big race divides in zoning, right? And there's there's kind of suburbs that were literally made for white people, right? And there was redlining and there were black communities. And I think part of, is, part of it is that that persists in today's kind of zoning laws and people are saying, well, abolish those or ch- change them somehow, right? Um, so I do support that. I also have an inclination that, you know, I'd like to see... Um, more housing built <laughs> right so there's the yeah. yimby kind of ethic which is to say yeah i don't mind if there's more housing built near me even if it disrupts my view because i want people to have homes so i agree with that i think but then i think what you would tell me is well rezoning or the type of rezoning that yimbies are talking about isn't necessarily the best way to do that uh yeah so my view is quite subtle, and I think the problem is once you get a popular movement like the Yimby Nimby stuff, subtlety just doesn't cut it anymore, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, very hard to cut through. So my view is very subtle. One, I like having more ho- more homes than fewer homes. Like, that's going to be good, right? More space, better, newer dwellings than less space, older, crappier dwellings. Mm. Yeah, there's no way in which that the second option is better. <laughs> Yeah. My concern is that the YIMBY type approach relies on an assumption about property markets that just has never been true. It has never been the case that the distribution of ownership in a system of property rights has improved dramatically through only the pri- functioning of that private property market. It always tends towards concentration over time. Uh, and partly that's because... You know, system is a monopoly in a way. You know, property, they say, is the original word for monopoly. Mm. Um, So I think it's a bit misguided to expect the market to um, deliver more quickly than it would have anyway at slightly different locations with a different zoning system. Yeah. Now, it's important to remember, right, zoning doesn't regulate the rate of supply of new dwellings. That is the number that you can build in a year. Dwelling regula- uh, zoning regulates what types of dwellings get built in which locations. So an analogy to, for example, a, a road is that zoning is like the lane markings. It tells you if you're traveling this direction, you have to be on this side. If you're traveling this direction, you have to be on this side. But if you're within those lanes, you can drive as fast as you want. Mm. Any application made will be assessed and approved as quickly as possible. And we can see in the planning system, right? You get, you get a market downturn, people stop wanting to build because that's the market incentive to not build, even though you can, when the market is thin and when the prices are falling. And then you see a boom and you can, you can approve, you know, five to ten times as many dwellings because five to ten twi- times more applications were made, right? You didn't change the rules anywhere um, to allow this to happen. It was always able to occur. It's just that the market incentive wasn't there to make that application. Um, so I'm also personally a fan of higher density. I think it's just an efficient way to grow a city. Mm. Um, so, you know, I live in an area that, um, used to have a bit of industrial and a bit of detached housing, and now it's got sort of between seven and 12 story residential towers in a lot of the industrial, but the detached housing sort of protected through heritage type rules and it works fine. Right. The catch of course, is that people get concerned about, well, you know, are you going to build the infrastructure to support this? Because I used to be able to drive down here or use this park, and now you've dumped, you know, thousands of new people in the suburb, but there's been no upgrades to anything. And now, and that that's certainly very common in Australia. We've had we had a huge construction boom in Sydney and Melbourne in the 20 teens and in the 2000s in Brisbane, and um, that's that's one of the main concerns. So I think planners themselves, you know, would navigate this political tension between existing residents and and the opportunities for new residents by being a little bit more um, uh, committed in the planning system to, for example, the delivery of upgrades to the public realm that are required for a higher density suburb. 
Um, so you might write into a plan that, you know, uh, we'll approve up to X thousand new dwellings uh, in this area. And when we hit that, we won't approve more until we built this park and the council will be penalized mm. for not building it and keeping up, you know? And if you can tie, tie a system like that and, and get the trust of the people that, yeah, that's going to happen, I think, you you know, you're never going to win over everyone, but I think the 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 warranted densification that that cities should have um, might go over a little bit more smoothly political politically. Yeah. But I also warn you, like, um, you know, the construction of housing the, in Australia, there's more bigger, better dwellings per capita than any point in the history. So we have fewer people in bigger, newer, more air conditioned houses massively bigger than any point in history and so it's it's a little bit puzzling to say oh it's because we didn't keep up with supply like we've we've been outdoing population growth for half a century this is not a sort of post-world war ii physical constraint on dwellings because everyone who built houses went to the army Hmm. um no we actually have heaps in fact if you look at china uh nearly a quarter of every single dwelling in the country is vacant Wow. So between 23 and 25% of every single dwelling that is constructed, it's built, there's no no yimbies, no nimbies, sorry. <laughs> but they're vacant, prices are high, rents are still high, because it's, you know, you got to think about it, the property as being an asset, right? Yeah. You know, across, across all alternative asset markets, some just has to go into property, right? And... You know, if you can buy a new property to park some money in, you buy new money. And you can think of these as little little floating empty empty bits of airspace uh, on the balance sheet. They just sit there because you need to diversify your balance sheet. Um, that's one of, the, one of those interesting puzzles, right, is that the more expensive properties become, the more vacant dwellings there's been. So if you look at Australia in 2000, the census was uh, 2001. I think 5% of all dwellings were vacant. And then the census in 2016, it was 12% of all, all dwellings were vacant. And prices were much time. higher so we could, as well, right? Order, uh, yeah, yeah, much, much <laughs> higher. We had a massive 2000s boom, right? So, yeah. And then in 2016, we'd had a 2013 to 16 sort of boom as well uh, in Sydney and Melbourne. So we have this interesting puzzle that uh, prices are highest they've ever been. Um, we've, built, we've got more better dwellings than we've ever had, but there's more vacant ones than we've ever had. And, uh, and again, one of those, you know, resolving that's a challenge, right? We, we've got to think, well, again, we're at that point. Well, housing developers make money selling housing, so why would they delay? Let's put on that hat. Um, why would a property owner, property owner makes money from the property, why would they not rent it out? Well, you know, you, my best explanation is, is sort of, relates to options, right? It's the same sort of thing. Well, an occupied dwelling is one type of asset and an unoccupied dwelling is another type that is more flexible for sale, for renting at a different price if the market changes, uh, and it gets a slightly lower return. It's a more liquid version of the occupied dwelling. And of course, the more liquid asset would have a lower return. So if you're in a, if you're in a world of high asset prices and, and where the capital growth is a very large proportion of the total return, that liquidity might be worth giving up that small bit of rent, net rental return. Yeah. So that's, you know, that's probably part of the story. I don't know if it's the whole story, but again, if you switch your brain into property as an asset class, people park money in property, it's an asset rather than, you no, know, property is a newly produced goods and service. That's what, you know, we're going to sell it to make money. That's then, yeah. you, you know, you go a bit, bit wrong in your thinking. I mean, it go, yeah, it goes back to this way of, of thinking of, Essentially, almost every market is basically governed by the same rules, right? And thinking of, like you said, housing is just another good. You know, you produce it, produce more of it, the price goes down. Um, You know, people want it more, the price goes up. But uh, land and housing markets, I think, are like one of the probably the primary candidates, along with the labor market, right, where I would say that kind of logic is incomplete at best. Yeah, yeah, it is incomplete. Although, you know, even when you're teaching economics, I don't know what your experience has been, but what's a supply shock? How do we teach a supply shock? We've got to go, oh, God, well, someone accidentally built a new factory and expanded capacity, (laughs) 
even though there were no sales, so they had to drop the price. You know, it's it's very hard to concoct an example. So typically we fall back on the, oh, it rained a lot, so we got more apples that season. And apples, you know, there's only limited ways to delay the sale of an apple. You know, you can dry it, you can can it, you can put in apple pies, right? Yeah. There's limited ways to delay the sale, so you, you decrease the price. So that's a sort of supply yeah. shock classically. But no one's around there, oh, gee, it rained a lot, so, you know, all these extra houses bubbled up and, <laughs> oh, what are we going to do? We better flood the market to clear it because next year we might get an, an even bigger crop yeah. growing, right? It's very hard to concoct it when you're in the world of, um, you know, big expensive capital assets. And, and the way I try to explain why we don't get supply shocks and why the market doesn't get flooded is, you know, housing is build to order. You don't just build dwellings and go, gee, I hope someone comes along and buy this. I spent half a billion dollars developing this new estate no you build it oh i'll come and buy one okay i'll sell one i'll come and buy one i'll sell one it's a little bit like building ships right you don't just go and build oil tankers and just hope there's a market you wait you get your order and then you build to the order and that's you know that's how it works in property that's why they have pre-sales to judge whether there's enough um you know uh market depth to actually take a whole building in one one go they'll sell one building it will be completed in one month like the completion date but the sales probably occurred over a five or six year period right as you built you know you're, you're fulfilling those orders over that period of time with that one building hmm. yeah i mean I've, I've always had a suspicion that that type of economics is probably best applied to farms um, and it's funny that you use the example of apples because you always get that. What's a supply shock? Well, it's the weather. That's the best thing we can think of. Possibly war sometimes you hear, but, you know, um, it, it's, it doesn't make as much sense. And there's no such thing as a kind of shock, as an external shock, right, when you're dealing with such a long and complicated process, where, as you said, like housing is built to order. It, ju it just doesn't make as much sense. Um, I mean, my favourite somebody mentioned in the in the in the chat is technology shocks, right? Like, I mean, uh, you get that's kind of similar where I don't know all the computers just stop working or something like that, and it, <laughs> I just uh, I really don't know what a technology shock is. Yeah, that's you know, I don't know if you want to do a quick sidetrack into you know general economic theory of <laughs> of supply and competition, but generally I think that's you know coming up with a new type of product to fulfil the same need with fewer resources. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's very, you know, I'm a big fan of this um, monopolistic competition type. You know, it's a bit muddy, right, the way these processes work. And I think when we simplify to this, you know, it's a supply shock in a competitive market. I feel like we're not really helping anyone. It's, yeah, it's a little bit too simplified. Yeah. Uh, so I think one of the things that's, that's um been occurring to me and a couple of people have mentioned it in the chat is you've talked a bit about rezoning and um basically what what you what i'm hearing is that you want to attach obligations to the rights that developers get when they claim they have a claim over land or uh some kind of property right now they get that claim they get the returns from it they get the you know control or power over the asset but there aren't really too many corresponding obligations. Um, in fact, they don't. Even, they get given them for free. So, apart from kind of the rezoning and attaching these obligations like public services to them, which you mentioned, which I haven't actually yeah. heard that as a suggestion before, but it makes a lot of sense. Um, but apart from that, I mean, what what kind of solutions do you think you are there are? Because land value tax has just sort of uh, been. <laughs> Uh, uh, in my mind since we started talking. So do, do you think that's a solution or are there other ones as well or instead? Land value tax is great. Um, <laughs> go and do a land value tax. In the ACT, uh, the Australian Capital Territory where Canberra is, the capital of Australia, it's a little territory like a state. Um, it has its own government and it's in the last 10 years um, transitioned towards land tax almost you know, as their main source of tax revenue away from stamp duties, which are a transaction tax on property. So they've done that. It's fine. Um, but the, you know, the, the, the land tax does change that dynamic trade off a bit, right? Because if the property value goes up, you pay more tax in the future as well as today. So, um, you know, it can go, well, you know, I could delay, 
and build something bigger. But if in, while I'm delaying, I'm paying all this tax in the future as well. And so that's going to um, change the incentive to build a bit faster now, even if the prices go down a bit. So um, it does do that, but I just don't think these effects are that um, going to be that huge um, overall. I think the big selling point of land tax is the distribution is is fair. And when I say it's fair, um, it falls disproportionately on people who have land, who have rights to do something and who aren't using those rights, um, sitting on undeveloped land. So uh, the way, yeah, you disproportionately charge them. So they're like, okay, well, I'm better make use of this space that the society has given me exclusive access to. Mm. So that's the big selling point. It's a fair distribution. Um, but in terms of, you can only vary the, how much the rate of supply changes in a year. It's, um, you know, and the market does that to some degree. I think if you want to make big inroads into home ownership, into the cost of housing, uh, you need some kind of public investment on the supply side, some kind of price regulated price way to get housing, right? Not a market price way to, to clear that market. And that's historically how it works. So, for example, after the Second World War in Australia, I think from 19... 55 to 1972, home ownership went up from 49% to 72%. Um, and of course, it's fallen from its peak in the 70s now to 65% at the 2016 census. And so, you know, what we've done is, you know, in the free market era, home ownership's fallen off. In the heavy government involvement of doing land subdivisions, public funding for owner builders to go and build some land, um, you know, there were huge. Um, rent controls on private landlords, which obviously incentivize them to sell because they got this asset they can't do anything with. They can't put the rent up, right? So better to get the cash and go do something else because you're also in an expanding economy after the wars, lots of places to put that money um, outside of the property market. Um, so yeah, that's, that's pretty much how every country gets high own home ownership, right? It gets there through collective public programs that allocate people their little space mm. without pricing it at market prices. If you look at Singapore, for example, their home ownership rate's about 90%. It was 23% uh, in 1960. They went from 23 to 90%, or it was 89%, I think. 23 to 90%. Like, mm. you know, Singapore, it must be because they're capitalist, free market. In fact, no. Obviously, Singapore has the Housing Development Board, which has built uh, more than 80% of every single dwelling for the last half century in Singapore and that gives every Singaporean the right to buy at a discounted regular regulated price uh, a property from the housing development board system and so that's how you get it mass public development allocated to people at below market prices and I think you know land taxes are great I think they're fair awesome ways to raise money and they do have intertemporal incentives to actually you know use land more productively um, but if you want to get from 50% to 75% home ownership or 23 to 90, and you want to massively reduce the out-of-pocket costs for young people trying to buy housing, you need to be a bit more radical than that, in my view. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, uh, this is nice for me because I'm just having basically all of my um, opinions confirmed by you. Because I, my first policy in the housing market would probably be to build more public housing right uh, available to the population. Simply because, I mean, everything you said aside, all these very intricate nuances, uh, it is also the most direct solution, right? Like, people need houses, build them for them. You know, not everything has to be super clever and counterintuitive, right? Funny you say that. A friend of mine, I don't know if you've seen him on social media, Dave Sliger, he, um, mm. he's a funny guy. And he, I said, you know, we've probably come up with 50 of the worst ways to make housing cheaper and get more homeowners. Why can't we just build houses and give them to people who don't have houses at a discounted price? <laughs> like if this was medical care, so when Australia introduced public health care, right? There's debates for nearly two decades. Um, you can't just give people free health cares. You can't just build public hospitals. We have to have this uh, system of private insurance and rely on churches and the goodwill of doctors to allow um, you know, patients who aren't insured on the weekends to get treatments. You know, that's we've got to we've got to do everything we can to make that system slightly more efficient. 
you know? Mm. And those debates for years, oh, maybe what the government does is they subsidize private health insurance. You know, it's like what the Americans are having their debates about private health insurance now. And so I find it funny, you know, there's a lot of think tanks and groups who, you know, they sit next to each other at a desk. One person looks at healthcare and goes, yeah, just, you know, build public hospitals and, you know, give people treatments for free. And then the person in housing is like, oh, do a rezoning, but have a social housing levy, but then have an income contingent this. And I'm like, just give people free housing, man. <laughs> Look at the guy sitting next to you. He's telling you the solution. We've been doing it in healthcare mm. for decades and decades. Everybody loves it. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it, it is, it's a funny old thing, I think. And yeah, Dave's point is that simple policies don't sell because if it can't, it can't be just that we don't want to do it. It can't just be politically, we don't want to do it. Here's a simple answer. It's got to be, oh, it's a really tricky problem. We really want to fix it. We just don't know how. We've got to get another research report from some economists. Yeah. So we end up, you know, we've got seven states here who every two years come up with a new housing strategy. Great glossy report, you know, done by an expensive consultant. And then they go and talk about their strategy. And then they build, write another one two years later. And there's this is the same number of houses. They haven't done anything. They should have paid those guys to build houses instead of writing reports. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's maddening. It's maddening. It is. <laughs> I, I, do, I don't know if this is a bit unfair, but sometimes when I like read recommendations from economists or any kind of policy expert, my, one of my thoughts is, well, is this recommendation basically giving you a job <laughs> continued into the future? Is it? Is it, uh, you know, not in a corrupt sense, just is it giving you more work and more prestige or uh, yeah. is it actually something that could put you out of a job, right? Um, because I think often it's like, yeah, when you say oh, it's so complicated, more research is needed, you know, all of this type of stuff. Oh, we wish we could. It's just like we wish we could solve it, but we can't. It's just a kind of a bit of a conservative impulse, isn't it? And it just ends up with more reports and fewer houses. Yeah, I'll tell you a funny story. They, you know, they call it the homelessness industrial complex in some areas, right? Um, I had someone contact me who'd re been reading my stuff online, who'd been working for a homeless organization trying to get people off the street. And uh, she said, look, I, I don't know if I'm going crazy, but I've read your stuff about political favoritism, groups, corruption, housing. She said, I don't think these people want people off the street because if there's no homeless people, they don't have a purpose anymore. So all the effective immediate solutions are made into complicated slow things that allow them to you know keep existing in their organization because the last thing that organization wants to do is is lobby for policy that destroys its very purpose and i'll get tell you another story i was i was you know recently i proposed that australia copy singapore's housing system and i've called it housemate because um the current trend in political policies is job keeper, job seeker, home builder, these conjoined words. So I'm like, housemate, that's an Aussie, you know, everyone has the right to a free house or a discounted house from the government, just like they do uh, hospital services. And I was, I was talking at a community event about this and uh, there was someone in the audience from Singapore and she, she said, oh, I really like that. Yeah, Singapore is pretty good. Uh, I've just come from Singapore. I'm a social worker. And... Uh, we don't have any homeless people, so I had to come here to help homeless people. <laughs> right. You, like, so, that's, you know, because, and it's not like there's no social work. Singapore has a system, but they yeah. have a public organization whose job it is every day, keep an eye on people, get them into housing, make sure they're trying to, you know, apply for, they're looking after themselves, make, keep an eye on their, like, they have a system. And she's like, well, they have a system that's working. There's no one on the street, so I came here. You know. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. No, I think I've had something similar. Somebody say they came from Sweden because um, there were no problems in Sweden. I mean, not, there are problems in Sweden, but they said there weren't enough problems in Sweden. So they came to the UK. Um, so, yeah, it is just uh, it's kind of a similar thing. Um, so, yeah, uh, I mean, one thing I kind of wanted to talk to you about, um, and you did mention it earlier in your suite of policy recommendations was rent control right um, oh, yeah. now yeah. you and i have both produced things on this uh and it's it's uh it's an extremely 
controversial policy among economists mm. um you know mm -hmm. according to some economists it basically destroys cities right that's the there's an Assar Limbeck quote, you know, the, the best way to destroy a city is through bombing. The second best way is, is through rent control or something like that. Um, mm -hmm. So I was just wondering what you think of that, because it, it seemed to be part of your policy recommendations. Yeah, OK. Um, so rent control. <laughs> so firstly, on the... You know, there's, a dis there's, there's no disagreement amongst economists about rent control. Hmm. It's me and you and five people in the world versus the whole discipline. Josh Mason. And, <laughs> oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah, me, that's you, right. Josh Mason. Um, I think that's about it. <laughs> and I'm sure we've convinced, you know, three other people each as well. Um, <laughs> but um, the thing about groups, right? So, you know, my other hat, you know, one is housing and one is... Um, networks of groups and political favors and how groups form by repeating favors and signaling to each other and wearing the right clothes and, and and how you form social groups and so economics is a social group right that's what that's what sort of academic disciplines are and so what, groups have a set of myths and stories they're legends right they're bible that they tell each other and they recite to each other and those myths and stories are elevated to be sort of like the meta binding identity of the group um so if if you believe all this we can disagree about other things but we've all got to agree about this and then we'll have these debates you know you've got to agree the bible's the word of god and then we'll disagree about the interpretation so in economics we all agree that rent control is bad and then we disagree about why it's bad and how you know whether it's be worse than bombing or or second worse compared to bombing right so um when you get this unanimous agreement in a group, it either means one thing, it's a super obvious thing and everyone should know it, or two, it's a taboo subject and people are afraid to have a debate about it so they go along with what the group sh is expected to say. And I think rent control forms falls in the second one. And we know that because, um, you know, if you think about these incentives for um, developers, right? Okay. So uh, what's, how, where do we start on this? Why don't we start with that um, study that came out of rent control in Berlin? Uh, yes. Was it last year or the year before? Y yeah, it was last year, and, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. And so it was quite interesting because um, essentially they found things like, yes, rents went up more slowly by you know, less than half as much as the unregulated rents. Um, they found that people didn't move as much. Um, there was also that study, I think Rebe Rebecca Diamond, two years earlier mm. of San Francisco, was it, rent control? And she found that, oh, you know, rent controlled buildings get redeveloped quickly, you know, expanded, demolished, redeveloped into condos. And that's interesting because um, the standard, the, the, the myth or the story economists have is that if you're rent controlled, you limited your return on that property. So you don't want to put any more money into it because that money you put into it doesn't allow you to increase your return. Yeah. Hmm. But in fact, modern rent control is actually not exact, not like that. It's in fact the opposite. Okay. So if you, for example, are in Germany and you have what is, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of like a, uh, there's a limit on how much you can increase your rent based on the council's sort of market reference number each year right but if you invest in your dwelling by renovating it you can change and jump onto a new tier of a regulated rent so in fact the only way to make more money in that case is to improve your dwelling mm. right so the opposite of what was assumed in the very simplified oversimplified story um, the other case is that well rent control limits how much of a return i can make in future years from this dwelling so if I have other investments that can make more, I will sell that dwelling to go and put my money in an investment where I can make additional money each year. And of course, the only way to get more home ownership is if that if landlords sell to first time buyers. Right. That's the only way you can do it. Right. You can build new homes for first time buyers, but those landlords still need tenants. Um, you know, so it's probably easier to think about 
just a single stock of dwelling because we only build you know one to two percent new dwellings each year it's it's such a small amount um so you know even if every new dwelling went to a first home buyer you're going up at one percent per year that sort of thing um in terms of home ownership so rent controls is a good way to make being a landlord a bad investment relative to other things and get landlords to sell to homeowners and that increases home ownership so <clears throat> You know, I think if you, if you, um, if you know, if we had this chat, say, 15 years ago, I probably would have come up with all these reasons why rent control was bad. Mm. And I would have done what other people do. For example, I think it's Rebecca Diamond. In one paper, she says, oh, rent control allows people to stay where they are. It makes them less mobile, which is bad, right? Yeah. People, people aren't moving. And for some reason, I'm just going to say moving's good. And then in another paper, she says, well, rent control means people get to stay where they are and don't get kicked out, which is good. And it's the same thing. <laughs> it's just you've got to sell, sell it as bad because it's a good thing and it's rent control. So economists don't want to hear good things about rent control. And you find a lot of those contradictions. I think your video had a, just a segment of good things called bad things. And I think when yeah. I reviewed uh, that paper, <clears throat> I, th I, I think I called my, my blog post... Uh, you know, um, calling good things evil, the economics of rent control. Yeah. You know, um, <laughs> but, you know, I mean, the rent is controlled. It's controlled by property owners, right, who have the power to set the rent. It's not like, it's not like we can avoid setting a price, right? We've cr created a system where the price is set through the, the operation of this property system, right? And we can create a different set where different prices are set different system where different prices are set and yeah there'll be different incentives for for people within it but you know you've got to add up the costs and benefits isn't that economics right yeah um, <laughs> um you know yeah thanks you know, uh, and, and i'm uh, sorry your uh, your video was frozen for a little bit but i actually think it's it's okay everyone was saying the guest is, isn't moving no but you're okay now sorry carry on <laughs> <laughs> No, no, no. That I, I'm pretty, pretty done. Yeah, it's yeah. just one of those cases um, where you know things that have exi existed in the world for a long time uh, and have good benefits, tangible, measurable ones. We just, you know, it's a taboo topic. We can't talk about it. Mm. Uh, and again, it harks back to that, um, you know, uh, Henry George idea and Mason Gaffney and how economists are sort of, you know, trained to ignore the property the contribution of property to the distribution of wealth and, and yeah. production in the economy. There's a great paper by, um, oh God, I hope I get his name right. It's a 1994 paper by, I think, Arnott um, in the Journal of Economic Perspectives um, called, what is it, Room for, oh, I can't remember, Room for Re... Richard uh, Arnott. It would Richard be. Arnott, yeah, uh, Room for Reflection or something oh. like that about rent control. Um, and he's saying, look, you know, maybe it's not, it's not so bad, but it, it doesn't seem to have made that much of an impact, despite being a very good paper. I mean, you know, I, I completely agree with you. You get, I think, you get this very simplistic view, right? I mean, what I talked about in my video was like Econ 101 and taking just the very basic demand supply model um, and uh, uh, putting a, a, a kind of, uh, you know, a price, a price ceiling on it, right? And... Yeah. And then you get a reduction in the supply of the thing. Uh, now, yeah. like you said, second generation rent control, which we sometimes call it, where there's all sorts of allowances and contingencies. You just can't you can't even put that on that diagram. It's just it's just too simple. And one of the things that bothers me, and this applies to the minimum wage as well, to a lesser extent, is that economists know that right in in their in their seminars. They know that. Right. If you said, oh, Demand and supply. If I went into a housing economic seminar, I said, here's the basic demand and supply model. But we know this isn't good enough for really understanding housing markets. Everyone would just be like, yeah, they wouldn't eat, they wouldn't say anything. Nobody would object to that. But then once it comes out into the wider world and once you get not just, you know, academic economists, but kind of people who um, like economics or who fancy themselves as economists online, uh, mm. then all that nuance is lost. And it's just rent control is bad, um, despite the fact that the basic theory just can't even make sense of the policy. You know, it, it can't you can't have second generation rent control yeah. on that diagram. Yeah, um, look, I, you know, I think we might have had this um, 
discussion online once before, but I, I think I view it slightly differently there. I, I think you can use this diagram. I think you just need two of them side by side in a relationship between them, which, you know, a lot of, um, a lot of markets with externalities, we use two diagrams, a lot of interactive markets, substitutions, we, we use these two diagrams. Because the thing about rent control is that it, you can only apply it to a building that's already built, right? Yeah. <laughs> you can't rent control the future, right? Yeah. And so once a building's built, it's been built for a reason. It's been built to order. Someone has, you know, justified that investment based on the current rents. Yeah. So after that point, the return <laughs> that justified the investment has been made. Any variation in rent because of other market conditions, because the government builds you a train line to your suburb, whatever the case may be, <laughs> that's rent. That's economic rent. That's a freebie. You didn't have to invest anything for that. So if, if housing was any other type of um, monopoly good, we would regulate it with rent control and say this is the way to get an efficient outcome. So I used to work for the state regulator in Queensland called the mm. Queensland Competition Authority, and we did rent control regulation on train lines. We did rent control regulation on power lines because we said, well, once you build this, the price that you are receiving to conduct current or charge trains was sufficient. And so we can set that price in stone right now and let you run as many trains as you can at that price. In fact, we have, it was revenue cap, right? So if you have fewer trains, we let you get a bit of return to share that risk. Mm. But, you know, essentially we let you have that price, but what we don't let you have is, is more afterwards. And if you can't get enough trains, you have to expand, right, at that price. And if you expand or upgrade, we will reassess your investment and let you get a return on that additional investment. Just like in rent control, right? You built a building, you've got mm. re residents in it, they're paying a rent, we'll cap it. If you, for some reason, need to in invest more, we'll let you get a return on that additional investment. And so if, you know, if houses were any other asset, we would um, we'd totally regulate it. And, and, and the same economists who say rent control is bad in housing will say price control or price cap regulation in you know, infrastructure is, is efficiency enhancing. It's yeah. just exactly the same logic, exactly the same system. And I think the, the problem is, is that people are trained, maybe we should talk about you know, pluralism and, and economic teaching, but yeah. it, it does come back to this idea that economists have as competition is about the numerical number of people in a market. Mm. And I, I think that's totally wrong. It's not about that. It's about free entry. Even if those two competitors, if someone else can show up mm. and enter that market, it doesn't matter. If there's one, but there's people on the sideline, they may have defensive pricing to stop a competitor coming up. It's that entry. The property market, right, is not, can't be competitive no matter how many people own it. So I'm going to test a, an analogy on you uh, and the audience, and I, I'd like to know if this makes any sense. Imagine, you know, the property titles office. Do you call it a title or a deed in the UK? The, um, the piece of paper that says, I own the land between these coordinates. There's a deed. And, you know, so-and-so has a deed. Yeah. yeah, so we call it a title. And we have a titles office. There's only one, right? And the titles office is essentially the, the company that, owns the three-dimensional space and those little records are who um, owns a share of that three-dimensional space and they go well here's your share here's your share you can't go and start a property titles office and go hey guys come to my property titles office i'll mm -hmm. give you the rights to the cbd right yeah, yeah. you can't do it right you have to go to that same one that same monopolist and go can i have the rights to that and i go no i'm sorry i've sold those you have to go get it off them now, hmm. right? That, so <clears throat> the analogy then is if, if all property, if the property titles system was a company owned by one individual who owned all the land um, and instead of property owners, they had a managerial layer in their organization that decided how and when to build what, in what location, we would say that's a monopoly, guys. That company is a monopoly. Your internal, ma you know, even though your internal managers get to make decisions independently across different locations, that's a monopoly. Hmm. We could, we could publicly list that monopoly, and we could all buy shares in the land titles office, like company shares, stocks, and it would still be a monopoly, right? Even if there's a million shareholders, 
because it's one title system. It owns all the land. It has all these managers of each location. <laughs> it's a monopoly. You can't compete with it. You can't start a new title system. However, we've tricked ourselves because we've said, uh, you shareholders, what we'll do is we'll say, if you want to be a manager of an area, you have to be a shareholder. Mm. How about that? You have to own a share and then you become the manager of that area. Well, we're now in private property competitive, but mechanically, we're exactly the same as a great big company who has local area managers who owns everything, right? The mechanics are the same. I still can't compete in the property market without buying space off you know, a manager of this property titles company. Um, and that's where I think, um, pardon me, we have our downfall is, is we've been, we've almost convinced ourselves that, oh, there's thousands of property owners, therefore it's competitive. I'm like, well, thousands of people own, you know, um, the Telstra, which is our sort of telephone monopoly, doesn't mean it's competitive. We regulate the price on it, right? Mm. In fact, millions of people own it, just little parts of it, just like millions of people own little parts of the property title system. Doesn't mean the system isn't a monopoly. Yeah. And, you know, if you could compete with housing by not having to buy a piece of the three dimensional space of the earth of someone who already owns it, oh, we're in a different story. We're in a competitive market. But you, know, you do. If you yeah. want to park yeah. your caravan or your house somewhere, you've got to buy it off someone who already has those rights. You need permission from I the think... existing market participants, right, to, to, <clears throat> to participate in the market, which isn't the same with your average business, your average commodity. Well, you know, you can take this thinking much further and go, well, actually, it kind of is, right? If I want to grow something, I have to participate in a mm. you know, property market, a land market in the farm. If I need an industrial warehouse, I've got to participate there. So in a way, what we're relying on and where I sort of see the benefits of this is I have to innovate to minimize how much property I use in my production. Mm. That's the only way. I have to come up with technical inventions and ways to do things that minimize my use of property that's the only way i can sort of enter markets and compete across all markets so i have this very nuanced view that has been evolving for for decades now that um yeah okay it's a rent but is it that special because you know if i produce a car i still have to buy steel that steel comes from a mine from a guy who's got an exclusive right to mine there you know and is charging me the market price when they don't need to um, you know, it's, it's a so, completely different view of competition, isn't it? Um, that you're developing, still seem to be in the process of developing as well. Um, yeah, I, I, yeah, well, I, I, mean, I, I, I liked I liked that spiel, by the way, for the record as feedback because <laughs> you were testing it on us, right? I thought it was good. Yeah, so, that's I why people that's thinking. That's why chat. I was rambling. <laughs> I was rambling, but I'm, I need to write this up cleanly, and I have done one. You know, um, if one person owned all the land, but we owned shares in it, would it be a monopoly? If, you know, if we owned, if our shares were associated with a physical piece, would it be a monopoly? Um, yeah, it's 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 something I think is a real mental barrier for communicating my ideas more broadly. Is is getting over this idea? But yeah, it's competitive. People will just go and supply stuff. You know, it's a it's a huge mental leap. And when when you're on the other side, whoa, you can you can start looking at things differently and tearing apart new ideas. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um... Yeah, so uh, just and one just to backtrack and slightly defend myself or uh, or clarify something that I meant when I said you couldn't put second generation on on the, uh, rent control on the simple demand and supply diagram, what I mean is literally that one. Like you can't just have that basic one with second generation rent control. What you said yeah, is yeah. you can add you can add another one, and I would say yeah, yeah, sure. yeah. But that's then that moves beyond econ one hundred and one inverted commas. Uh, and another comment on that is yeah. that. As you were talking about monopoly, right, which is because there's Econ 101 and there's Econ 101, right? You learn about monopoly in Econ 101. And if you do price controls with a monopoly, then it's beneficial. Um, now, that that doesn't have to be true the same way the basic model doesn't have to be true. But mm. it's just to say that there's lots of different ways of approaching this. They lead to different solutions. So let's not be dogmatic about what type of economics we need to use. Uh, which I guess segues nicely yeah. into pluralism if you want to talk about that. Yeah, let me just let me just say I totally agree with you on that. And and my attitude, uh, you know, um, is no one's 100% right about anything. Everyone's on their journey like me, 
and some people are very far ahead of me on some topics and I learn a bit about that and then sometimes they're totally off base on others but it doesn't matter I just learn what I can um, from different areas but on that you know supply and demand I guess what I'm trying to say more so is not that um, the view on rent control came from uh, you know this belief I think it's the reverse I had the belief first politically motivated and I've reasoned back to Econ 101 mm. that's what I'm trying to say mm. that um, don't underestimate the you know you know economics is very politically connected um, pun me discipline so don't underestimate the um, sort of political and social motivations that lead to you know all this reasoning whereas in re you know it, it's made made to appear that the reasoning led to the political conclusion, but quite often it's the opposite's the case. And I, I'm not I'm not saying I'm not guilty. I have my, you know, different views on different things. But it's it's worth being aware of that when you read uh, very broadly uh, on political topics. Yeah, I mean, I well, I'm going to be a little bit less generous than you. I mean, when I, when I'm talking about something like rent control, right, and how um, how ingrained the belief is, you know, I, I get. I get the feeling because people are so dogmatic and unwilling to have a conversation about it. Um, it actually, mm -hmm. you know, not only is it quite a strong intellectual commitment, I actually think for some people it makes up about 25% of their personality, like opposition to rent control. I just think they define themselves by it. Like, and it's just, honestly, I, I just, I find it very difficult to have a conversation at all. Well, I think you've just stumbled on to something that's, that's that's true in general, and and I guess where I was going with this once once an idea becomes a political movement, it becomes part of your identity, and then all hope of nuanced discussion is lost. You know, you then you know you're for you're against rent control, but you're for rezoning and you're a yimby, whatever, mm. and that becomes your identity, and everything reasons backwards from those beliefs, right? Mm. Um, whereas you know, when you're deep in the thick of it like me and, and when you're reading lots of different types of approaches to things, you can sort of go, yeah, rent control, I could take it or leave it. It's not the only way to address anything. Um, I think what would happen is this, that would be good. These would be the bad things, the costs outweigh the benefits in these situations. You can look at the nuance, but you, because it's not your identity, it, you know, it's, it's harder to get, as you say, it's 25% of some people's identity. And that's hard to let go, right? It's hard to not have a group or an identity or, you know, push for something you believe in. It's hard to just be that guy plodding around, not really knowing, trying to pick up the next bit of information. I, like when I write, I write like I know everything, right? But in reality, <laughs> that's what I think I know now, but yeah. I'm going to just keep, keep plodding along. And I look what I wrote 10 years ago. I'm like, oh, yeah, it's much more subtle than that. That's, mm, that's not quite right. Yeah. Yeah, no, I do, <laughs> I don't. I don't like reading things I wrote or produced uh, a month ago, let alone ten years ago. Like God, you idiot! Um, but uh, yeah, yeah. So I mean, yeah. Th so this is a nice segue into pluralism, right? Because I think what we're touching on um, here is the, the the dogmatic conception of economics and economics as this set of kind of rules or laws, right? And you know, you can't disobey the laws of economics, demand and supply. You have to, you know, advocate this set of policies, otherwise you don't understand economics, which is something that, you know, I, I mean, my, my pseudonym is Unlearning Economics, right? I, I'm very mm -hmm. committed to uh, trying to extinguish that, that kind of dogmatic view of economics. And I know that you've done a lot um, and you've got resources available. Um, maybe I can I can post them underneath the video this video when it's uploaded for teaching economics in a less dogmatic way. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So um, <laughs> look, it's really hard, right? Um, probably what I want to say first on on pluralism. Yeah, economics is actually quite a broad church. Um, there are definitely, you know, schools within it and different areas where you can and can't say certain things. But, but in general, my experience has been at conferences and you know, events that <clears throat> there are useful concepts in, that, in there that help people communicate and help progress learning. You know, sub substitution, optimizing, you know, uh, the opportunity cost of this and that, you know. Um, and there's a lot of good ideas. Um, 
But as you sort of say, the details matter. Like there's a good idea, supply and demand, and then there's the detail of the real world. And, and it's hard to get a handle of that because, you know, in property, there's one issue. In, in another case, there's one issue. Um, there are the welfare implications. Like, do we care about well-being and welfare? Is that even a thing? Can we measure it? Um, so, look, it's a, it's a really hard journey. And I think I've been sort of on the same journey as you. Uh, when I worked in the government departments and I'm like, oh, okay, learning about how regulation works in practice to compared to theory, for example. Um, I did a lot of reading very broadly. Um, Outside of economics, I'm I guessing as well. Is that? Uh, economic related yeah. um, ideas. Um, but for example, when you do get an economics degree, you don't really know how the national statistics are calculated. How do we know what the occupancy rate of dwellings are? Mm. How do we know? How do we know how many dwellings there are? How, many, how do we know how many people there are? How do we know what the consumer price is? Is, the price, is, it, is it sensible to have an index of consumer prices? Yeah. You know, in, in economic theory, there is the price level, but that's all prices, right? Labor, assets, you know, consumer goods. There's no price that's not in the price of, of theory. And yet consumer prices, we then impose this production economy where we go, oh, yeah, uh, bank fees are in it, uh, missiles are in it, house, implied, <laughs> imputed housing rent for owner occupiers is in it, but, you know, the imputed rent of, or the imputed value of driving your kids around instead of getting a taxi, that's not in it. Uh, the value of cooking at home, that's not in it, but the value of someone else cooks you is in it. Um, if I mow my neighbor's lawn for free, that's not in it, but if, if they pay me, it's in it. You know? Mm, yeah. Um, you know, we... we, we you know, you do get a bit of exposure, but then, you know, I, I started reading up, you know, how is this calculated? How do we know this? And yeah. and it really takes you back to the basics. You've got a toolkit, but you just, you know, one of the, one of the, you know, I learned a lot from um, Steve Keen, you know, just sort of breaking down that, you know, these optimized, you know, these equilibrium, you know, models, you know, they actually, they barely work on their own assumptions, if at all. Yeah. And then I'm like, oh. Okay, so is this an attempt to just generalize some phenomena, but it's not, we shouldn't take it too seriously, the actual model when we tweak it, because we don't really know the details. We're just trying to generalize that something goes up when something goes down. Right? And this is one potential way. Yeah. You know, so he, he, he helped me along. The, the modern monetary guys, you know, they helped sure. me along talking about, you know, how do banks settle transactions and why is there M1, M2 and M3 different types of money? And, and why is M1 so high, but we don't have inflation, even though, you know, the, the, what is it? Um, uh, Friedman's uh, sort of yeah. monetary hypothesis says it should be. And then you go and you just read the central bank's processes. You know, they publicize. This is, this is how we clear at 5 p.m. And this system tells yeah. this person this, and then this bank does this. And these people have these accounts and you're like, oh, Wow, that's exactly not <laughs> nothing like what's <laughs> it's in the textbook. It's completely the reverse and of what you're taught, right? Yeah. So I and, and so uh, what I what I did in this journey is well, every time I learnt something that was verifiable like that, and if it conflicted with the textbook, I'd tell students, "Don't read that chapter. It's wrong. Hmm. Read this instead. This is from the Bank of England. This is from the Reserve Bank of Australia. This is money, because that that textbook's nonsense." I'm going to just show you here, you know, um, yeah. which is, I think for a lot of people, that's you know, people in academia, they're socially, you know, at low risk people. I think standing up and saying, oh, this famous guy, I would like to be impressed by me who wrote this textbook we're all using. That chapter is completely wrong. Mm. I'm better than them because I actually read this stuff. This is how, this is how the world works. Here's some material. Um, it takes a, takes a, you know, you've got to be a little bit arrogant in a way. Um, to yeah, do, I've, been, do that. I've been accused of being uh, arrogant many times for doing things like that. I mean, but, I don't you know, know, maybe I am, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I think you need it. You know, you, you're not going to get intellectually curious unless you're kind of arrogant. Like, I want to know more than the other guy. I want to, yeah. you know, you know, I don't want to stop. I just don't, I don't want to be satisfied with your story. Yeah. yeah. I don't, sorry, I don't really believe you. I'm going to keep digging. Um, it's, it's a, 
it's a it's it's not always good way a good way to get people to like you no, so certainly good... not i mean i i, I couldn't uh, agree with you more about some of the examples you used i mean i i'm i'm a big fan of and have uh taught gdp statistics to first years um because you just you just firstly it teaches them what like how to work with data which you don't get enough of in economics you get increasing amounts of statistical techniques actually but the the gathering of the data still, I think, is way too absent and not rewarded within the profession. So you teach them about that. What do these statistics actually look like? They learn what GDP actually means. But then you get them to ask these questions like, why? How do we count finance in the economy? Why has that changed over time? You know, why is, like you said, you know, cooking at home not counted? But if I go to a restaurant and order the exact same thing, that's counted. And you start to ask questions like, you know, what is the economy? Um, and you realize that that's kind of contingent. Um, and that opens your mind a little bit, as opposed to just drilling them with certain theories and just saying that's economics. And then they end up kind of a bit stuck in those ways of thinking. Yeah, I'll give you an example. Um, right. A, a very timely example. Um, it's very, So you're totally right. But it's then very hard to keep that in mind day to day in the press. GDP went up, CPI went up, you know, uncritically. These are the, you know, these, this, is, this is meaningful. And you've just come out of an economics course. You're like, oh, you know, it's pretty arbitrary at the end of the day. Take it with a grain of salt. So it's very hard to keep that sceptical attitude going when you're bombarded every day. But you should because if you look today at the inflation scare that's going around, you know, there's a lot of lessons from today. Um, you know, people will say, you know, we put too much money in the economy, but mostly the inflation is, you know, used cars and things that need uh, microchips and, you know, a few construction materials. It's, it's surprisingly narrow, right? And so you question, the question's got to be, well, how does the demand side theory of inflation um, get you only inflation in used vehicles and building materials and not yeah. everything else, right? Like, mm. so... You know, I've, I've probably put it out on Twitter a few times. You know, the US is like, oh, well, you know, we've got all this great inflation, but their consumer price index is made in a completely different way to ours in Australia. Yeah. We don't have used cars in our inflation index, but they do. Their used cars are 3% of the inflation index and used cars have gone up 40%. So 3% of 40% is what that's contributed, right? 0.12% or whatever over the last 12 months. Um, we don't. We don't have that. So our yeah. CPI is never going to boom as much as theirs because literally it's a different measure. They make a and lot so, of quality adjustments you know, in the US as well. There's a lot more of this hedonic pricing, which is just basically saying, you know, if computers are better yeah. now than they were, then we're going to um, change inflation. Uh, so they do mo that the most in the US. We don't really do it in the UK. I'm not sure what it's like in Australia. So we do it for consumable audio, visual and computing equipment. Um, they're trying to do it for new cars, um, <clears throat> but it's fairly limited. But then then that's another question, right? So the audio, visual equipment part of the CPI has fallen like 90 plus percent in the last 10 years. But of course, you can't buy the same product from 10 years ago in the shop at 10 percent of the price today. You can only <laughs> buy today's goods and today's goods are the same price. They're just better. Mm. You know, yeah. you can't. You know, if your TV was $100 20 years ago and it's gone down 95%, there's no $5 TVs around, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you're telling me the TV's 20 times better, mm. right? But in the price index, oh, no, it's only five bucks, you know? Um, so, you know, just having that in mind and, and, and you know, but it, it's, it's, it's useful for today, right? So now I can make predictions that, other people wouldn't because I know how the CPI is made and why it's different. They also have um, imputed owner-occupier rents in the US CPI, which is like 28%. Mm. We don't have imputed owner-occupier rents. We only have market rents and the cost of new construction. And so our housing um, weight is only like 22% instead of 28%. So there's another huge chunk yeah. that's missing. So the US might get 8% inflation this year. If the same thing happened here, we might only get 5%. Yeah. Right. Um, and you only know that, you know, there's probably now our audience, you, me and 50 people in, in the country that actually know that. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah. But it's useful. It's really useful. And um, I think economists should be trained to actually be able to go and dig around. And as you say, learning the, the national accounts and how to go and get the data and dig around and see how it's made. I did that in my master's course. Yeah. Uh, I did a master's degree. I did that quite a lot based on this household survey we do, dug around into all the weights and the way that survey is created. So I sort of that was a lesson for me to then how to go and dig in every area where I'm looking for data. Uh, so, yeah, I think I think it is important. Uh, yeah. By to, the way, uh, just to let you know, the, the viewership's been pretty good for me. I mean, usually it's me playing Age of Empires 4 quite badly. So <laughs> it's less interesting than this. But this is like 160 and it has been consistently for, for a while. Uh, so it's quite a big audience. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, say good day, everyone, in the comments. Yeah. Um, <laughs> good day, everyone. Um, so, so, um, yeah, sorry, I lost, I got a bit distracted there. But yeah, no, so, yeah, we yeah, talking about, yeah. a critical perspective on, on statistics, right, can give you a critical perspective on economics as a whole. I mean, if there was one very simple takeaway, I would say, from the audience that, from what we were just saying, it's that cross country comparisons of th like macroeconomic statistics oh please God. do not oh you know germany's more wealthy than um than the uk or less wealthy like the way these things are measured josh mason actually has a very good oh my god we just got so many good days by the way uh we uh germany has a completely different system ways of measuring wealth josh mason's post on this is really yeah. good just don't believe somebody who starts making these very ad hoc comparisons like inflation here's like this inflation there's like that it's just going to be a completely different way of calculating the statistics not to mention a different context from which they're coming right yeah yeah so uh, i'm totally with you on that and it's really hard you know economists want simple stories simple comparisons um the world is is not that simple i mean there's some good rules of thumb to navigate the world but you know, one of those cases, I think there was a lot of chat last year or the year before about comparing poverty globally, right? You know, this whole story. Mm. I think you had a video on that. Yeah, that yeah. Oh, poverty uh, statistics. Are, oh. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, and the, and the idea that, yeah, less than $2 a day, but $2 as in like two US dollars a day living in U the America mm. is what it means, right? I'm like, no one can live on that. No, like the actual produced goods and services, to, you know, to eat to clothe yourself and like it's it, it's no one actually stands up and goes yeah it's actually impossible right it's impossible that there's a country uh it's impossible for humans to be alive on that, that few amount of resources and calories right um so there must be something else going on and it's it's kind of obvious when you think about it mm. just go to america and see see how many people can you know let let uh you know a quarter of the population live on two dollars a day and just see you know there it's it's going to be chaos. They're going to yeah. they're going to um, end up with non market production to sustain themselves, right? Yeah. And so, so quite clearly, two dollars a day. What you're measuring is market production, and what you've inferred doesn't really make sense. There's, you know, there's a lot of information lost along the way. And yeah, it's great that that number's going down. However, it's estimated, um, but. Again, you just, you know, you're not measuring. Like, just like in a Western household, right? Mm. When I clean the bathroom, I could pay someone to clean it or I could do it myself. Yeah. It's the same production, right? But that's not counted. Yeah. Right? So, if we all paid each other, we all, if I, you know, if my wife paid me and I had a business cleaning yeah. my bathroom in my house limited, um, we'd, we could go get 10% GDP, right? Like yeah. in the US, um, you know, the new European... GDP standard in 2012 uh, said uh, illegal drugs and prostitution. That is a newly produced good and good and service. It's not a market, you know. It's not in the regulated sort of uh, formal market, but it has a price mm. and a value. Um, so what we're going to do is make all the member countries come up with an estimate of the value of um, prostitution and illegal drugs and put it in their GDP. Yeah. What we're also going to do is we're going to reclassify military weapons from consumables to investments. So we're going to add the cost when we build them, and then when we blow them up, we're going to add that value as a consumption item with an imputed rate. It's mad, right? Once you <laughs> go down this line of reasoning, you've just got to be like, hang on, can I trust yeah. anything? 
And my rule of thumb is, you know, in relatively short periods of time, you can trust changes in trends, right? Of a single country using the same method. So a single country using the same method for a decade, if something goes up and down, whatever that represents conceptually probably went up and down. Yeah. yeah but comparing, you know, for example, comparing um, inflation in the 70s to today in Australia, right? Everyone goes, oh, you know, inflation was really high then. I'm like, yeah, but mortgage interest was in the inflation and it's not anymore. And mortgage interest is, was really high. So, um, you know, in that measure, you're counting a whole thing that is not measured anymore, mm. you know, as 14% of your CPI weight, of course, it's going to be higher than it is now. Um, so it's even hard to make that comparison in the long run for one country using a very similar method um, over 50 years. Yeah. I mean, well, relating it back to the poverty statistics as well, I think it was maybe Lance Pritchard, I can't remember, who said, well, if we're going to have the dollar the dollar a day, it was previously the dollar a day, now it's 190 a day, but the poverty line in US dollars, why have we not calculated it from poverty rates in the US? So they've done this kind of Frankenstein's monster type thing where it's in dollars and you've got to convert using inflation statistics, which we've already discussed, but in a very poor country where they don't even have established statistical institutions, it's even, it's even worse, right? Um, you're getting your, you know, you're getting your statistics from like one firm or something. Um, <laughs> or, you know, that's probably a bit of an exaggeration, but, you know, a really small non-representative sample. Some cases the data doesn't exist and you end up converting that and you use some combination of different poverty lines in different countries. This is how the poverty line was originally designed. And it's just, you know, garbage in, garbage out, right? Uh, where did this line come from? It didn't come from proper careful consideration of what poverty actually is it came from basically statistical convenience or convenience with data um and you know you're almost tempted to say laziness <laughs> i think you're right and uh i think it's also partly a bit of um um intellectual superior superiority of economists they like to have clean data that they can do fancy techniques with mm. so if you went around measuring poverty by interviewing people asking old people how they grew up and compared to young people in that area um you know looking at the conditions and you know tabulating and recording and documenting things case study type you know qualitative um analysis and, and documenting all that and mm. You know, you can do some averages and statistics if you want, but you're not going to be able to do anything fancy. Um, I think you get a lot of information. Yeah. But that's not really that well rewarded in economics. You know, I that's can't. A, that's an understatement. See the American <laughs> Economic Review. Imagine the econo you know, American Economic Review, right? This, this journal everyone wants to get in. Imagine you went around to a dozen. Um, developing countries where the poverty measure was meant to have gone down a lot and you went and you just documented and you interviewed people and you took photos of them and you asked them how big their house was and how, what it was made of when they were young and where they live now and mm. where they went to the toilet and how much they ate and what you know and you and you sort of tabulated that and you had pictures and you put it in the AR and say this is what poverty looks like they'd be like show me a new time series method right like, yeah yeah it, it, <laughs> You know, I'm like, but I can't, I can't, you know, I've got a bunch of immeasurable things. I've measured lots of different ones and I've tried to um, provide the best information I can, I can about what I've learned from actually going and doing the legwork. That, that's all I've got. Like everything you do in addition to this with your numbers is made up from yeah. this onwards, right? Yeah. Like this is the information. Yeah. Everything you make up from now is just your assumption about my information. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, yeah, yeah, there's a bit of that. More qualitative um, research, I think, in economics is absolutely crucial. And you just, I mean, one guy who's really good on this is Morton Jervin, who wrote, um, was it Poor Numbers and also um, Africa, some uh, a book about Africa. Africa by the Numbers. Or something. Africa by the yeah. Numbers, what, yeah. Um, and just about how, how you need to understand the context that these numbers are coming from and it gives you a bit of a different picture uh you know so you know at a basic level you know gdp can rise because of uh kind of something that we might call actual 
economic development and growth, or it could rise because of a commodity boom, or it could rise because of a change in measurement, right? And, you know, you're not going to know that necessarily um, just from, like, the aggregate statistics and running advanced techniques from them. The best place to learn about it is to actually, for example, go to the country, talk to the people there, talk to the people who work at, for the government, um, talk to, you know, ordinary, everyday citizens and, and all the rest of it. So, yeah, it's just... I mean, it was it's a slightly different topic, but uh, somebody said, I think it was Janet Yellen, she said, in 2006, if you'd wanted to publish just the balance sheets of Lehman Brothers and a bunch of interviews with, with them in the AER or any economics journal, really, you wouldn't, you wouldn't have got published. And yet that would have been one of the most useful things you could do in the field of economics at that point, because it would have shown that something was wrong, right? Yeah, so that's exactly right. And and so I, these are the types of lessons I, I apply these days is like just get on the phone to the person who makes the data, right? <clears throat> get them to send you stuff. Um, you know, get them chatting about, you know, all those, you know, in every organization, there's these things that you know are wrong with the system, but you don't talk about because they're really hard to fix, <laughs> right? You don't publicize them. Um, you know, I, when I worked in the competition authority, one of those things was we did an audit on whether the rail uh, operator preference their trains against others. And I'm like, that'd be really tricky to do, wouldn't it? And I'm like, yeah, well, we just ask. <laughs> we just ask if you preferenced your own company. There's nothing we can do. We say we can do it, but we can't. It was one of those great secrets, right? Yeah. And so, you know, that's, that's what I do. And I, I call, so I do a little bit of consulting work. I, I, I did uh, after my PhD. So I did, for example, a, a report about trophy hunting in, in seven sub-Saharan African countries and that sort of economic value. And you know, the numbers were all over the place. So I just emailed all the, the agencies and uh, just, you know, got direct line of contact and said, you know, how do you even know this? Did you just make it up? Like, um, you can't have that many resources. And then you, you can get to the bottom of it and go, yeah, well, we rely on this other aerial survey that so-and-so did 10 years ago. And then we estimate based on this, mm. but yeah, it's just, you know, it, and I'm here, you know, if I was this well-trained economist, I see this published number and I'm like, yeah, that's the number. Whereas now I'm like, it could be the number <laughs> or it could not be the number. We don't, we don't know. It's the number that they had to produce a number and that's what they put up. Right. So then you, um, but you, you, you can then flesh out, well, this is a number uh if you want to put it out but you know you can then do some sensitivity and say well it could be here it could be here because you know we actually don't know and so let's let's deal with what we don't know um rather than pretending what we do know absolutely yeah it makes me a bit angry talking about this for too long because it, it reminds me of uh what you know economics kind of could be and <laughs> this is what it actually is and i i uh yeah i really would like to do things like that but i know that they're not rewarded right yeah and i i don't know how to change the system right you know i i had high hopes for a while that you know most systems don't change from within right? mm -hmm. that's why you know I, I'm, I'm very into the sort of austrian um you know this this ecology of free markets you know if one organism dies it makes room for others and you know things change and evolve mm. i think that happens with organizations and and so economics is a discipline you know we're not just going to change we're the top dog right in social sciences we're not just going to go oh you know we're not good enough um you know all the leaders of our discipline are actually you know just sort of um you know the high priests that just say the same stuff they're actually not that interesting <laughs> <laughs> But it can change from without, right? If, if there, was, there were groups like INET and others, you know, trying to come up with a little bit of a, you know, external group. And, you know, there's, in the US, there's groups trying to start new academic institutions and things like that. I think that's, that's how things change. Um, but I do, you know, there's a lot of really good young economists. Um, there's a lot of good economists just generally, but it's a very big discipline, right? And there's yeah. a lot who just, you know, did the 101 work at a bank, work at the treasury, uh, teach 101 in academia, stick to a limited number of topics, then, um, you know, you can't expect everyone to know everything, you, yeah. you know. And I think uh, a bit of respect for the different types of knowledge 
in economics, someone who's good with the surveys, someone who's good with um, you know other techniques, someone who's good with qualitative mm. uh, assessment, and someone's good, someone who's good with interviewing. You know, there's that uh, book, Asking About Prices. I think it's Alan Blinder, yeah, the author. Yeah. Basically, you know, the question is, well, how, how do prices get made, right? Well, let's go and ask companies who set prices <laughs> for their products, right? Totally revolutionary. Yeah. And uh, there's Idea. also and, um, uh, Why Wages Don't Fall in a Recession by Truman Bewley, right? Which is basically the same thing, but for wages. And it just, you know... That, to me, I mean, there was somebody in chat saying that we sound like we want to be sociologists, but I think that's what we're talking about, right? Because it's it's defining economics as quite a narrow method. For me, if you, economics, right, going and asking businesses how they behave, interviewing them, studying them, if that isn't economics, then I, I don't really understand what is. Yeah. Look, I, th I think... Um, there are a lot of broad-minded economists who read sociologists and who read other disciplines and all the, the industrial organization guys. Mm. Um, you know, I, a lot of the time what ends up happening is you go and you learn from another discipline and then you bring it back and translate it into economics and say, I've discovered something. Yeah. Or you take, you know, I, that's a bit flippant. But, um, you know, you do need to communicate it to other people in your discipline, right? And it's, I, can't, I can't just go and use the jargon of sociology communicate to economists i need to i can borrow some methods and i can apply them and i can translate them. so i think that's good in a way i'm actually i i think that's that's really good for the discipline and, and to get people used to it but then <clears throat> then you get the attitude of well i'll wait till someone else you know incorporates those ideas into economics before i take it as true i think i think being actively interested um in other approaches in your field is is definitely worthwhile it's a value a isn't it thumb. it's like or it's a culture shift right it is like about having a certain attitude towards reading broadly and being willing and able to engage with other methods um i mean i think in terms of a good example is behavioral economics right so it's very much bringing things from psychology but putting them into the mathematics that economists are used to um, and I think overall, it's been a good thing because now you've got, all, you know, uh, much more appreciation of, you know, uh, non-rational behavior. And but yeah. at the same time, it can in the long term reinforce this view of economics as, you know, until somebody's put it in a utility maximization problem, I'm not going to pay attention. Um, so, you know, I mean, it's a structural problem. It's a systemic problem, right? Uh, you need to have different ideas of what constitutes economics and different things rewarded and taught within the profession yeah i agree i think you know no discipline's going to be perfect no no discipline's going to have everyone you know happy to read everything about everything else but i think it you know just promoting promoting the attitude of reading um, across fields now of course that's not rewarded in academia or anything but you know economists are not too bad at it um but in some ways, my personal view is being the top dog of the social sciences, you know, governments don't go and ask social sociologists, you know, what policy should we do for housing? Rarely. They'll ask economists that what policy should we do for trade or regional development? Mm. You know, so economists have this sort of, <laughs> I think, um, standard they should aspire to that, that yeah. should be a bit more rigorous than other disciplines because of this social responsibility that somehow we we have um got as a discipline i completely mm. i completely agree with that um i'm gonna have <laughs> to wrap up soon because i have to do my actual job um in in about 45 minutes have you got time to stay for a little bit of q a because the chat were asking a couple of questions yeah all right yeah let's do a few questions there are right. another 15 minutes for sure cool cool uh so youtube account asks cameron can you talk about the economics in Australia and the government, current government's economic approach? Nothing in particular, just generally. So that's quite broad. You might want to narrow it down a bit, but you probably have some things to say, right? Look, I think the smart thing is not, not, not to think one side of politics has a major difference to the other and separate what's spoken about politically and what's actually implemented um you know most of politics is hot air um 
mostly in Australia, both parties have the same underlying philosophy. I've spoken to left, you know, Labor politicians, and they'll just tell me, you know, well, it's not the government's business to be involved in housing anymore. Okay. Well, you're the left party. What do you think is going to happen? <laughs> right? Yeah, you know, just get market outcomes, the same as we had in the 1800s. Every every boom and bust cycle we've had since federal, since um, you know, uh, Australia was discovered, and, and you know th that occurred in the US and the UK for centuries. Um, so I don't think they're they're super different, and I I just don't pay attention to 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 that. Um, everyone just wants to give their mates money and tax people who aren't their mates, and that's I think just how things are going. I don't have any big insight on that yeah yeah i mean i i don't know i wonder if australia's unique in that regard i mean obviously it isn't in one sense but i do wonder if the that problem is especially big in australia the kind of corruption problem that we opened with because of histor historical you know, reasons well i mean look at the us right they've got a democratic federal government um and you know, a lot of the time what you end up with is promising, you know, policies in opposition and then say, you know, saying why the government is so powerful and risking so much by doing what they're doing. And then you get in there and say, oh, it's too difficult for us to do that. Um, <laughs> so we'll do something else, right? Like this yeah. is just the political game. I think you have to, you have to have a real strong filter on that. Um, my view is that um, either side of politics could implement any policy on any day of the week if it fitted in with the polling and the political problems that they faced on that day. Mm. I could get the right of politics to do a public housing program. I could get the left of politics to do it. I don't, you know, I just sell it in a different way, right? But the same actual fundamental physical construction and pricing of things would be the same. Yeah. So, yeah, that's how I see it. I, I don't see there's enough of a difference to... So only this government would do that, only this what government does that. Um, I think it's a lot more opportunistic and less grounded in any sort of um, economic principles. Right, okay, that makes sense, yeah. Okay, uh, next question is Custard Lemon who asks, this is a good question, why is it house prices have risen in all the English-speaking countries at the same time? Do they all have essentially the same housing policy? <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, I mean, private property markets are the system. Well, it's not even just English-speaking countries, right? Mm. Germany's booming. Um, and Singapore, even their, their public housing um, sector is rising in price because they have a secondary resale market. Um, you know, it is global. So, interestingly, in May 2020, I think I, I did a podcast um, with my mates uh, at Nucleus Wealth. And I argued that house prices were more likely to rise 20% than fall 20% in the next 18 months. Mm. And um, just before we did that podcast, all the major banks had come out and said, oh, we're preparing for house price declines of 30%. It was all over the media, prices falling, people panicking. And I said, well, actually, um, I have nine reasons why that's not going to happen. And I went through, you know, we're at I acknowledge the cycles. So, you know, the Georgists are very into property cycles. And mm. um, I said, well, you know, we've we've just had essentially a bust from 2017 to 2020. We don't have busts after busts. Mm. We have an outsized stimulus. People have more money than they've ever had. We have a lower interest rate. So everyone saved on their home loan. They've prepaid uh, principal uh, at a rate that, that they could never do before. Uh, renting money is half the price of renting a dwelling. So we're going to see a huge shift uh, into renting money instead of renting dwellings. Um, and anyway, I went through and, and that's what happened. Uh, I even bought a house um, that year and, uh, and prices prices boomed more than I even, I, I even thought. But it's predominantly the interest rate, right? And, you know, if you read central bank um, documents, they will explain that and it, that's, this is also in the economics textbooks. Mm. Monetary policy transmission mechanism. Well, where lower interest rates means people can borrow more for the same repayment to buy a house. Yeah. When prices go up, people feel wealthier. The wealth effect lets mm. them leverage to borrow money to buy a boat or a four-wheel drive or whatever else they want to do. Do a renovation. And that is what stimulates 
productive activity in the economy. It's right there in the textbooks. It's right there in the central bank documents that, mm. oh, we reduce interest rates to raise house prices. And yeah. here we just, we halved interest rates, essentially mortgage rates in Australia went from just under 4% to about 2%. And that just already declined from four and a half to sort of three and a half to four um, in the few years prior. So I went through all these reasons. I, I, I showed that, you know, uh, the mortgage balances to income had fallen after the financial crisis. It was also true in the US. You know, the, the balance sheet recovery in, in the decade since the financial crisis was really thorough. Yeah. And so there was so much financial firepower. I'm like, it's not going to collapse. People have a lot of money right now. They've paid off a lot of debts. Anyway, people said in May 2020 that I should give my degrees back. I got it from a cornflakes packet. If this is what <laughs> universities are churning out, it's a waste of money to get an economics degree, you know, basically name calling and all that social media stuff. Yeah. And what do you know? You know, just being right doesn't pay sometimes. Mm. Um, so that's, that's it. It's essentially, it's low interest rate policy. Um, yeah. we've, we've decided that macro stabilization policy occurs by manipulating housing markets. And in Australia, yeah. we have variable mortgage. Rate. And it's, yeah. it's ingrained, right? Isn't it in, in, um, yeah, countries across the world. In se- it is central bank policy, right? It's monetary, a lot of monetary policy, certainly before the crisis. I mean, now we have other things like quantitative easing, which are, you know, slightly different. But the, the interest rate manipulation going through the housing market is is the policy. And that's that's hard to dislodge for, you know, a lot, a lot of very complex reasons, right? Political reasons around how people's homes are their now number one source of wealth in these countries. Reasons we were talking about with um, experts who, you know, want to keep their jobs at the central banks. And, you know, there, there's so many different reasons that that's ingrained. So, yeah, thanks. That's a really good answer. Um, I've got two more questions for you before we go. One may be relatively short. It's quite a direct question. Um, the other's a bit broader. So Andrew Paul asks, and I, I've never heard of this idea before. What are the chances of negative mortgage rates in the next 20 years? not the cash rate, retail mortgage rates. Oh, hi, Andrew. How are you going, mate? Uh, How's it going? <laughs> um, uh, if it's the Andrew Paul, I know. Yeah, okay. I, think, I, think, I think we've had this conversation on Twitter. <clears throat> I think last year, I, uh, 80% of new mortgages in Denmark had a negative head, like, interest rate. Um, the average rate, including all fees and charges, you know, the effective rate was 0.8% or something like that. Um, I, my view is long term, unless there's some fundamental, fundamental political shift or revolution, monetary policy is here to stay. And it's here to stay to 0% and it's here to stay past zero. If you look to Europe, um, you know, they did their best to manipulate the interest rate like the cent- the central bank cash rate below zero to get mortgage rates um, very close to zero. I don't know if Australia will see a negative mortgage rate unless it's some, you know, zero percent sort of promo thing where it's zero percent for one year, but there's high fees. I, I don't think we'll quite get there. But I think interest rates between mortgage interest rates between one and two percent in the second half of this decade seem likely to me. Um, that's because... <clears throat> housing markets go in cycles. Every housing market goes in cycles. Um, a lot of people think they go in 18-year cycles, but sometimes they're 16 and sometimes they're 20 years. Mm. Um, 18 years since 2008 sort of bust is 2026. It seems reasonable to me, given the price trajectory of seen, that there'll be some kind of rolling over of prices. Are there are big, big busts like the US housing market or a, a smaller one like Australia in the financial crisis. And so the central bank will have to respond with lower interest rates. I mean, it's the, they've got no other tools to use. <coughs> Pardon me. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, that's my expectation. A, a, a booming few years with rising interest rates, cut next couple of years. Really sort of sketchy peak, peak period where <laughs> we all argue whether this is a, just a slowdown in an ever, ever spiraling house price growth. And then after some sort of correction, um, mortgage interest rates between 1% and 2% in Australia. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, and so I'll go for the final question then we're going to ask. Um, have you got a bit of a cough? Are you? 
I don't know. Are it's you... just this room tonight. Oh, no, okay. I haven't. It's just yeah, yeah. humid. Um, so Sophia... yeah, I got the fan blasting on me here. Oh, okay, that's it. <laughs> so Sophia asks: Should economists focus more on informing individual action and civil organisations rather than state policy? Wow, that's a good question. <laughs> Very good question. See, um, I'm, I'm, I'm. I don't know how you call it. I'm organisation agnostic, right? Mm. If the state does something well, okay, let it do it. If the state does something bad, but can sort of um, get out of that sector <clears throat> and the market does fine, like supermarkets or whatever, you know, food distribution, I don't think we need a government to get involved in that. It seems to fulfill social needs pretty well. It's a robust, flexible system. Hmm. Then then markets do it. If, if we got up a bunch of sort of not-for-profit um, housing companies that, that could somehow um, get cheap housing going, yep, get them going. I think this, where state involvement's <clears throat> important is where you really want to have um, sort of a collective decision about who gets things, right? Mm. <clears throat> like, because private organisations always, you know, none of them are going to be big enough to just satisfy everybody themselves. <clears throat> Pardon me. And so if you're thinking about hospitals, yeah, you have private hospitals, great. But we should have public ones as well. And so, you know, I, I'm, I'm, the way I've sort of evolved on my thinking, and this is, again, it's very simplified when you learn economics, you know, fixed market fails, failures with public regulation or, or public provision. But, you know, sometimes you just try and start a public organisation and it's really bad. Hmm. The incentives are wrong, it doesn't work. And so now I'm in this view of we, we should be more experimenting and allowing an ecology of organizations to rise. And if there is a big effective private organization or many of them, then we should say, hey, <clears throat> we can either, for example, in housing, use their skills and create some kind of funding mechanism so that they can participate here, but we don't have to create the organization or we're happy with how it is or, or we regulate or we subsidize certain people. So I think um, you know, Australia stumbled into it in healthcare with this um, parallel public and private system, which works quite well. Um, but I think that's where you want to go as well. I think you want to foster uh, as many private organisations, businesses, you know, associations, not for profits, whoever, church groups, yeah. clubs. You want to foster an ecology of these things for people to self-organize and you'll find successful organizations can arise. I don't think you want to have, even when the state produces things, I don't think they should smother alternatives. And that's, again, you know, it's, it's just this competition idea, but it's also de-risking, right? You know, you don't, you don't want the state to run something and, you know, it all fails for some political reason mm -hmm. and there's nothing else there. You know, so I guess I, I like, I think about it in terms of like a rainforest, you want lots of different things growing up rather than a monoculture. Um, but it's okay to, for the government to plant some big trees to sort of, you know, have things hang off and grow on and, and feed off. Um, so for example, when I think about um, cities and, and transport within cities, my view is, well, yeah, you can have a good rail network but you should have lots and lots of different ways for people to get around, Yeah. right? You should have cycle paths, you should have buses, you should have rail, you know. There should be many different ways to get to the airport, not just one, because if that one breaks down, you know, the city's um, stuck. So, and it's that same sort of principle of having lots of alternative ways to satisfy that human need. Mm. And the state involvement, I think, is really about, is this, does the system we have, is it fair? Are we all happy with it? Can we, can we use the state power to sort of redistribute wealth and, and money very easily? I mean, that's the thing governments do, put money in people's yeah. bank accounts. They're really good at it, right? Yeah. It's cheap. You know, the age pension system, amazing, right? But you wouldn't want to say you can't have any money when you're 65 because we've got an age pension, right? No, you just have an age pension and if people can do whatever else they want, right? Yeah. Um, so anyway, that's, my, that's where my thinking ha has, has got to at this stage. It's, it's a very, um, you know, it's very economics -y, like a bit of competition between public and private. I want like the school system. You should definitely have public schools, but doesn't mean you shouldn't allow private schools. 
Yeah. Right. You should allow these new schools. And, and, you know, there's some in my area have just moved in. They're new schools. They cater to certain students who struggle in, in big, um, big public schools. Brilliant. Brilliant. And if the government thinks the fair way to do schooling is by ensuring that every f- child has the same subsidy, then you should contribute to those private schools some kind of subsidy or some proportion of what you um, subsidize the public school. I mean, there's no reason you shouldn't have. I mean, it, that's, that's a choice. But allowing, allowing those private organizations to flourish is, I think, important. And that's, you know, that's why I say those, the Austrians and, the, and whatnot, you know, I think they have some good insights there on, on the, the, the emergence of private organizations yeah. to satisfy particular things. We, we will just get together and do things yeah. um, if, we, if we have the incentive to. Well, I'm, I'm a huge fan of Eleanor Ostrom as well, who talked a lot about uh, polycentricity, which is, I guess, a pretentious word for set, what you just said, which is having lots of different types of organisations, lots of levels, local governments, states, you know, uh, private organisations, co-ops, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, you know, the, they all need to be independent in some sense, but also re- interact and reinforce each other. And then you get, you know... The problem you were talking about where, oh, I don't know, you you get this in the States, right? One government comes in, they just uh, uh, abolish, reverse everything the previous government did. But if you have organizations that are supporting that program and that policy that aren't dependent directly on the federal government, Mm. then you you have less chance of that happening, happening, right? Because there's more of a political uh, base for, for the policy. Um, yeah, exactly. Um, it's good you mentioned Ellen Ostrom. Her, she came across my mind earlier when you when you were saying something as well. And and maybe we should wrap up on a sort of positive note about economics. Her Nobel Prize win was really, I feel like a watershed in terms of um, my confidence in terms of wow, that's really how you just go and ask people how they organise, like, yeah. and what rules they've come up and how they evolve. Like, to me, that was so it, like. It inspired a lot of my thinking and it sort of gave me a bit more respect that, oh, there's actually people who really respect that sort of approach and I'm going to try and incorporate, you know, talking to people more and finding out how things really work. And uh, so, yeah, that as I said, you know, economics discipline, I think because it's so big and so politically important, we can be very cynical about the, the monoculture and the, the 101-isms. Um, but it is so big, which means within it, there are really some super interesting contributions and super interesting connections with other disciplines. And so, um, you know, the art is to find those people yourself and connect with them and, and cultivate them and support them and, and each other um, and sort of almost be the change you want to be. I think that's the best you can do. Um, I, I, although I said, you know, starting a new sort of discipline or a new university is, you know, it would work. I, I, I'm not going to do it. I don't. I don't see a critical mass there for it. So I think the thing to do is just be the best sort of, you know, social scientist you can be in your discipline, and stay open-minded and curious, and don't stop evolving your understanding of things, and ask the next question, and you know, find out who's asked it before, and and where they got to, and what new things you can find out. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, that is a very positive note uh, to end on. So, um, yeah, thanks so much, Cameron. Um, it was, yeah, we, we chatted for like two hours in the end, which is longer than I thought we would. So uh, this was great. Uh, thanks for coming along. Mm. And I'm sure we, we, we will talk at some point in the future. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I'll have to, when, when travel opens up a little bit more, um, yeah, we'll definitely catch up in person one yeah. of these days. Yes, it would be great to meet in person. Um, so I'll let you get out right. of that humid room that's making you cough and uh, get to bed. <laughs> and thanks to chat. Right. Thank you, everyone. See you later, everyone.